Welcome to the Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. We're on City TV, we're on Facebook. My name is Bernard Avle. The Point of View gets the right issues. We bring the correct guests. We ask them relevant questions, and you're always the better for it. It's live and interactive. Our hashtag is Point of View. We are at City TV TGH on Facebook. And we have a great show for you. The NDC went to the polls. 157 of the constituencies have their uh, parliamentary candidates. We're going to bring you three of the most interesting we could find. And I'll tell you who they are when we come back. But call your friends. Tell them there's a great show tonight. And it's going to be on for one hour. Stay with us. So 524 candidates were vying for 157 positions. Well, when the chips came down, a few were left standing. Some of them won by less than 10 votes. Others won by hundreds. We'll be talking to three of the very best on the show tonight. Sat next to me is Samuel Jata George, the NDC MP for Ningo Pram Pram. He won by a hair's breadth out of 809 votes. He got 407. There was even two sport ballots. He's back on the show. Great to have you. Pleasure. Jata, I like Pleasure. your boy. <laughs> <laughs> Not a boy. Nice one. The Baba is good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also have a lady who took 77% of a hundred, and there were three other contestants. Seventy-three. Seventy-three. That is a shalaking Gisela Tete Abutui. It's another guest. Great to have you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Great. And the man a lot of you have been asking me to interview on this show. A lot of people thought he was joking. In fact, there was a story that he wasn't going to run. Some said that when the uh, by-election came, he ran away, so he's not ready to do the thing. Mm -hmm. He has a relatively comfortable life as an actor and a celebrity. He wants to enter the rough and tumble of politics, and he entered with a bang, 88%. This is the man. He's in the studio. His face speaks for himself. Just show the camera to his face. <laughs> yeah, man. They said you're a brand, so I shouldn't mention your name. Oh, I beg. John <laughs> is it Dumelo or Dumelo? Well, they always say Dumelo. Dumelo? And, and the, yes, and no, no, always say Dumelo. Dumelo. Mm. Dumelo is more rhythmic. Yeah. But with the always, when you eat okra. Uh, uh, Dumelo. <laughs> Dumelo. <laughs> it could mean many things. Great to have you. Congrats. Yes. Thank you. Thank I you. I thought you were joking, no? No, not at all. Serious? Yes, not at all. And you didn't spare um, a foie a double boy at all? It wasn't me. It was a delegate. Seven <laughs> fifty-eight. Yes. And she had 99. Mm. Why? Uh, well, I, I, then again, I'd like to say good evening to your um, viewers. Um, mm. I think that it was just because of my hard work mm. and the fact that I had been in the constituency for such a long time. And also before the by-election, which or during the by-election, which I didn't contest, I had been doing a lot of work on the ground. And so that amounted to the 88%. The Do you think people underestimated you? It's like celebrity, it's on Facebook, it's hugging people, mm -hmm. so it's like, he it doesn't know politics. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and, and the good thing I did was most of the political stuff that I did, I didn't put it on social media. All the hard work and everything, I, I never put it on social media because that's not what is mm. important. What is important is the one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the, with the delegates, which I was doing. And so that's why people were thinking, ah, but it's John contesting, he's not contesting here and then, you know. That's so they thought you were doing the campus visits and you were doing the publicity thing, yes. not knowing how to work delegates. Exactly, exactly. That's the whole mm. point. But, but when you go to the delegates and you speak their language... They would understand you and they would oh. give you, they would, they would vote for you. Okay, that's by way of introduction. I'll come back to you. Thank you. Gisela, 73% and you were four. So I think of the people sitting here, you got the widest margin using the law of averages. If you work it out that way, then. <laughs> so had you always been eyeing the seat and waiting for your sister to finish so you can continue? <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the agenda there? Not really. Not really. She's always, she'd always been, well, she had been a candidate. Okay. It's just that the opportunity has come. Okay. Has presented itself. And uh, I've always been involved in development in that area. I used to be a member of the government appointee on the district assembly. Okay. Okay. In 2015. Okay. And so, and uh, I'm a native of. That's where you're from. Yes, I'm a native of Awutu. Yes. Okay. So you've lived there. Uh, Not really. I have a house there. Well, my father has a house there, so we have okay. a house there. And. Uh, so the people know you. Been going there since I was six. I see. <laughs> but your sister is older than you. You are the second of the, the, the girls. There's three and a half years between us, yes. Oh, okay. But you are an architect. Yes. yes. I see. So w when did you decide to run? 
somewhere last year, July. Oh, okay. Some discussions had gone on when she got her position with the United Nations that there was not going to, she was not going to contest again, obviously. So discussions, decisions, consultations went on like that. Wow. Right? And then somewhere in December, I took a firm decision that, well, this is it. I should go for it. Wow. And how was the ground? You know, you, you politicians, you have very technical <laughs> terms. We tested the ground. How was the ground? <laughs> <laughs> well, so during the consultations, it was good. Mm. It was good. I mean, I obviously must target people who would tell you the truth. Okay. And uh, some opinion leaders and the chiefs in particular. And if you see the green lights from there, mm. then you know that, okay, you have, that is one step um, crossed, if I can say I that. So people, not those who like you, which means that some delegates will see, some people will come around, we like you, they'll just chop your money and then you... Yeah, you have to do, you have to check and check again. Be sure. And Yes, be sure and, you know, do it another way and... and that, So yeah. had, had, do your consultations tell you you are going to win the, the real thing or you do consultations only to the extent of, for the NDC race? Oh, no, no. But you're, not, you're going for the long haul. So you, you have, you've calculated the thing to the end, and you know you have a good chance. I do. Against a sitting deputy minister. He himself, he knows that I do. Hey! <laughs> I like that. He knows. knows. He knows. Has he called you to congratulate you? No, he hasn't. He hasn't I'm yet. not sure he will, but he hasn't. Okay. There's honor among... Anyway. Jata, <laughs> you're a no big problem. man. Small boy. You are, you are the only uh, uh, place that we sent a live... Okay, to be fair, we sent a live TV crew to two places. And I think a lot of media houses came to your place. And when I was scanning, you were the only place they were doing live routinely. Yeah. What, what was that about? Let me say a very good evening to our viewers and to my colleague panelists and say congratulations to them and to yourself. And thanks for checking up on me in the lead-up to the elections. It really touched me. Um, <laughs> I didn't see it coming, and I'm grateful to you for it. But um, Ningo Pram Pram is Ningo Pram Pram. <laughs> I've always said that um, there are 275 seats in Parliament, but not all seats are equal. Um, <laughs> it's the same way you talk about the uh -huh. I mean, you can't, you can't just take it as any ordinary seat. It's the same way Ningo Pram Pram. Or if Harun Idris leaves Parliament, that seat is not just any ordinary seat. It's enigmatic. There are certain seats that... The, the seats themselves have character. And so Ningo Pram Pram is one of such seats. And um, my coming onto the scene was not without drama mm. in 2015. Mm. And, and so the lead up to then the 2016 elections. And, and then my little foray into John Dumelo's constituency during the by election. <laughs> had, had oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> putting a panel together. <laughs> Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> had also heightened some of the wow. expectations. And then, then you had. Um, a gentleman who's been seeking to be a member of parliament since 2010 and um, become chairman and then a year after becoming chairman constituency resigned, chairman constituency chairman resigned to contest and all the um existing acrimony in the the and he he launched a certain media blitz to announce himself and through all kinds of salvos i try to stay out of the media normally i stay out of the media during my campaign my campaigns but uh, i do one or two calculated interviews. Um, this time I had to do, he drew me into the media a lot more. I did about five interviews to have to set the record straight because the calls were, and so wow. people expected it. And then the fact is that this elections was not just an election between two people. There were several factors at play. Oh. There were institutions and individuals <coughs> at play. There were uh, unseen hands that everybody in this country knows uh, that had decided and some had even openly made a declaration Enemies from of your, your own creation from, from not of my own creation i mean uh they're chasing their own shadows is it absolutely people within the party who thought that who is this guy he's just come also oh, even uh, internally within the ndc there were people who didn't want you to win well obviously people have stated that even this afternoon some of them uh, went a little far to embarrass themselves a bit but i mean that's fair this would include your predecessor 
um, not him necessarily. I'm speaking of people who may be holding certain positions okay. within the party at the moment. Okay. Uh, my predecessor, I believe, is in retirement. Uh, he's gracefully gone into retirement after 2016. <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he's not one of the people. That, but definitely, he also had an interest in there. So his hands were in there. Wow. And, and I mean, let's not run it away. I was told by very powerful people in this government that my seat was a seat they were going to take me out, they were going to take out. I mean, I was standing with uh, Honorable John Jinapo during the media review and a very, very key person uh, in the government said to me that, look, we're taking you out. Go up, come down, we'll take you out. And I saw the mighty hand of the state in my So in my they were election. taking you out through the primaries? Yes, because, because the, the seat is more... The general elections, I mean, they don't even have a candidate. The, the candidate who appeared to have made the biggest move for them and brought the margin very close to just about 3,000. Yeah. Uh, in 2016, when the NDC was losing across the country, I beat him with about 11,000. So he's given up. He's moved. He's my cousin, Sylvester. He's moved to Botiano. He's transferred his... He's run out. away. <laughs> he's transferred his vote out of the country. Hey, so, <laughs> <laughs> the, MPP, the MPP is now wow. shopping for potential candidates. They, they found two of you are, them. So you are caught in trouble. That's what you're <laughs> I, I love it. You, 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 are, you are for peace, but when you speak, they are for war. When I speak, they are for war, you know. So you know, you're essentially taunting the MP. They don't have a candidate. So they, 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 you are saying they were the ones trying to. Essentially, you're accusing, I, I actually you are, you are accusing Michael Nkwete, who's your chairman, of being supported by the MPP. That's almost true. Uh, well, I haven't said so. You are drawing that conclusion. Uh, but this, <laughs> this morning, this afternoon, I spoke to my campaign team and thanked them. Mm -hmm. And I said to them that, look, um, I'm, I'm excited about the, the 2020 elections. Mm -hmm. If it was possible to put the two MPP candidates together on the ballot, we will beat them. <laughs> because we've launched an Operation Gap 20,000. That's, that's the that's We'll, the we'll come to that. I just wanted Absolutely. to some introductory thoughts from you. Wow. Okay. Amazing. But, you know, put, put up his numbers because even though he's talking tough, 407 out of 809 statistically is a dead heat. This is this I mean in certain of course because this is a two man race, but this is very close. So you 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 said you win by 60%. You sound very confident. You 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 sound up for it. But this is supposed to be chastening. This is actually a chastening. We, we, I mean we, look at it there. Absolutely. It's a and, chastening. And no 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 no. You see with 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 an understanding of all the dynamics that were at play in my constituency, I dare say that any other person apart from me would have lost this election. And, and let me tell you this, um, for those who may not want to believe it, I'm deeply spiritual. And when I say deeply spiritual, I mean Christian. Mm -hmm. I have a close walk with God. Mm -hmm. the, the, the results are God speaking to everybody who thinks they're waging war with me. The numbers you see there, are very they have they have deep meaning <laughs> the margin of seven seven is perfection we, we are into seven. numismatics now no, the study not, of numbers it's not necessarily that Quite. the numbers the number seven because look i could have beaten him with two votes okay. i could have beaten him with 12 votes in fact there were five delegates who everybody knows are my are my supporters who some way somehow had their names disappear so they from the register the director of elections actually did a letter approving that they should vote. Still, they didn't Just before vote. they wanted to vote, he reversed the decision. If those five had voted, I would have beaten with four twelve. But God wanted people to see his hands. So the seven. seven. The number seven. <laughs> you get it. And, okay. and, and, and so for me, this was God speaking to the people. Because I asked God, should I go? I mean, the, those against me are many. And his words were clear. One with God is majority. <laughs> so John, when you see such things, and seen hands, and people say, we'll yes. take you out. Yes, yes. And all these things is, I mean, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure you're in the right game? You know, acting is difficult, but it's a different well, matter. It happens in all industries, all fields ah. of life, yes. And even, I mean, it's the same thing that some George is saying is the same thing that happened in my constituency, where you had unseen hands also playing such a role. And mm. uh, of course, yes. I mean, you had even, even sometimes they say the opposition is from within, not without. I mean, so I think must, m most of my opposition was from within. People who didn't want me to contest. People who felt that, okay, it is not time for me to, to, to enter parliament. People who just felt that, oh, what is he coming to do? People who felt that they were probably more competent than I am mm -hmm. to be able to, 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 to you know, Represent the, people. represent the people and even people who even didn't want to represent but just didn't want me to just move why i mean is it because of who you are as an actor or what is well it? there are so many factors there's so many factors that play number one because i'm an actor number two because they feel that i'm aligned to 
a certain group of people or I'm aligned to a certain person. And I mean so many so many things just came to play and, and, and I always like 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 Sam George was saying, I'm also very spiritual. And and if God speaks, God has spoken, and you can't stop. So you work. are clear in your your heart that this is the right thing to do. Yes, definitely, definitely. Not based on people's opinions. No, no, no. It's not based on people's opinions. I mean, mm. because people ask me, John, why politics? And I say, look, I've lived in East Ligon for so many years. I've I have served the party, the NDC, so many times, and and at the end of the day, it's the people who are calling me to represent them. Because I also is, is a is a different constituency altogether. I mean, if you take Legon alone, you know, Legon is a constituency on its own. Mm. And so we need a different approach. We need a youthful approach. We need we need a pragmatic approach to be able to win the seats for Ayahuasca West. And everybody felt that, uh, and everybody even still feels that I'm the right person to be able Why to Why didn't win. you go to any of the voters? Because your name suggests that you have... You are from the Volta region, right? And the way politics works in Ghana, yes, you could have gone for an easier seat, yes. for the general election. Yes. May have been more difficult in the primaries. Yes, why did you choose a seat that NDC lost by ten thousand? Bernard, if if you look at the statistics, first and foremost, uh, you know, if you look at the results, twenty two thousand and four. NPP had 24,000. 24, thousand. Two thousand and eight, they had twenty eight thousand. Mm -hmm. Two thousand and twelve, they had thirty one thousand. 2016, they had 32,000. We didn't, a lot of NDC people didn't vote in 2016 because of voter apathy. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the MPP just increased by 750 between 2012 and 2016. That should mean that it's not that their votes increased marginally, it's because our people didn't go and vote. And that should tell you that the seat is ours. If we play our cards right, we will win the seat. The second thing is that, yes, if you go to Volta region, yes, if you win the primaries, you are into parliament. But at the end of the day, everybody will say, oh, yeah, John went to Volta region. He's gone to his hometown. He's won. He's in parliament. He wants an easier route. No. I want the hardest route. I want the most challenging route to be able to get to parliament. And at the, at the end of the day, it is for the good of the party. Because if we win Ayahuasca West, which we are going to win, it's going to add a lot of votes to the NDC party. And then we can win the general election in 2020. But when did you decide to do politics? Because you say you've been in the party. You, you mentioned NDC. Right. I, right. Because right. I'm sure people would have questioned your NDC credentials. In fact, some of the Afua supporters said she's been in the party for a long time. And yes. the impression yes. was that here's a celebrity who's favored by some big shots in the NDC who's yes. using his popularity to come yes. and take something right. that we've worked for. I mean, the truth is I was born into NDC. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. Okay. But when I started acting, you know, there are certain professions that you can't really show your face politically because mm. it's not right. And so I think it was just up until 2012 that I really started showing my face politically. Okay. And so I've been in the NDC for such a long time. And so when people say, oh, when did John come? When I mean, are, at the end of the day, we want to win the seat. It's not about when you came. It's about wow. who is most comfortable uh, competent enough to win the seat for us and so it's not about when you came and you've been there for such a long time can you win the seat for us yes or no yes john can and so let's vote but for what's john. your what's driving your interest in going into politics because again being a celebrity and a farmer you're already <coughs> in public life right you're already a philanthropist in a sense right so why do you want to go into parliament I think a lot of people would say that it's to serve the people, a lot of parliamentarians and a lot of politicians. But the truth is that indeed it is to serve the people and indeed it is to make sure that you are part of the decision-making process that will positively affect the lives of Ghanaians. It's as simple as that. Yes, I'm a farmer, but at the end of the day, I see what farmers go through. Yes, I'm a young man, I'm an entrepreneur, mm. I'm a businessman. I see what businessmen go through. I see what students who finish school and are looking for jobs, are looking for, for ways to make their lives better go through. And so I feel that me getting to parliament, I can be able to speak their language and solve their problems. Wow, that's interesting. We'll, we'll come back to you. Giselle, so you have already served, because as you already said, you've been uh, the government appointee on the assembly. I know you've been on some important boards. Uh, you did stuff at the airport. Both civil, Ghana Civil Aviation Civil Authority and, and Ghana Airport, Airport Company. Company. Yes, so you you already have your hands in the pie. So why are you? Why what do you need to go to Parliament for? Because I'm told Parliament people line up for school fees. They say you have to come for funeral. You say you don't visit. So Parliament is not easy. He's even getting some grace. It's not, it's not easy. You, so what is what is it? What else do you want? I've got my grades already, though. Yeah. <laughs> From both places. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> 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 can't get worse than this. <laughs> well, 
No, you, you know, it's a it's something like a stage of self-actualization, something along those lines that you think that you start looking at life and the impact that you can make on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, people could be lining up for school fees and that sort of thing, but you can also help them to improve their own livelihoods. And if you have the ideas and the creative solutions to do that, then why not go ahead and, and offer that mm. to them you know, and, and make things easier for people? I mean, what, what do we gain if, with all the knowledge and all the experience that we have, we keep it in this cup and yet not you know, bring it out and share it? And but people say the poli political system is corrupt. They say it's... it's, it's uh, my point is you can make a difference. You're already in the built environment. You're a respected architect. You've done things. You've served on boards. You, f you, you are fairly influential. Why do you need to put on the green, white, red, and black and go on the field? What, what does that do? Because it, it was through the green, white, red, and black that I also went through some of these, influential, these important boards. They gave me, that gave me the opportunity to also build myself up. Mm. And so it comes a time when you also feel that building yourself up, it give back also. Mm. And so it's, it's just, it's almost like a natural progression. Mm. Yes. Interesting. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll now talk NDC broad. So we'll do two things. We'll, we'll focus a bit on the specific constituencies and talk a bit around what, what's happening in your parties. But I think the bigger question for Ghanaians is, why should we give NDC a chance? You people, 2016, I mean 2015, you said what? dead goat and things, doom so and all these things. So what is going on? What has changed? Have you all of a sudden, because there are one or two corruption scandals, meaning we should go back to NDC? I think one or two. Or maybe three or four. Or, or, five, said, or five or six. Hundred. We'll come back. <laughs> we'll, 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 I'll explain one day, one FTA. <laughs> we'll, we'll, one day, one fraud. <laughs> oh, look at that. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll come back and find out more about whether the NDC is ready for, for power. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. My guests are, uh, of course, Samuel George, Ningo Bram Pram, MP and also candidate. I also have uh, John Dumelo, who's the candidate for Yasuo West Wogon, and Gisela Tete Agbotui. Your comments are welcome. We've received a lot of them. We'll be reading them as the program proceeds. So let me just come back to a little bit of the, the numbers, right? So it seems as if in parts of the country, the NDC is doing well, but in certain parts, the NDC is not doing that well. I'll give you a couple of examples. So I'm a Saman. I'm a Saman for a long time has been 80-20 NDC. Then it became 60-40 NDC. Now, one of the reasons why they presumably kicked out their parliamentarian was that the gap between NDC and MPP was too small. And so they were afraid that people was going to take that seat. If you look at the Greater Accra Coastal seats, MPP essentially wiped you out, except for coastal facing seats. MPP took all the coast from Tema East all the way. Apart from to do DO, DO, your constituency, and then a couple of others. So it's only been three years. What, what's, what makes you optimistic in terms of first the local politics of Accra, that the NDC is going to re uh, capture some of those seats you lost? Well, I think that um, let's not kid ourselves. The 2020 election is not going to be a walk in the park. The MPP is not going to walk away from power with ease, and so for some of us, um, we are not f uh, we're not confused or deceived mm. about the reality of the challenge that that faces the NDC. Um, in Greater Accra, we lost seven seats, seven seats we shouldn't have lost if there was proper planning and strategy. You would want to see some level of work and if strategy. There was, if there was good governance. It, it, it was it's that. amazing how politicians always think that they lose elections because they don't strategize well. Don't you think we are smart enough to know that you fail, so we'll vote you out? Why is it always strategy and planning well, and communication? Well, well, Why well, is it not performance? Well, because majority of Ghanaians, for example, I'll give you a typical example, believe that um, even though Akufuado and Baumia did not give specifics, they could not even give you the total number of villages that will be covered under the one village, one dam, they believed it. So it's basically about strategy. It was about communication. No, they vote against the incumbent. They don't vote for the new new person. So they vote against your bad performance. If, if, if that's the suggestion, then this government could even be kicked out before the 7th of December 2020. <laughs> Based on what survey? <laughs> Based on the fact that, and, and I can give you a website that has been chronicling the scandals in this government. On average, you are averaging 1.5 scandals every three days. Interesting. So that's almost one scandal every two days. Okay? It's, it's, it's that bad. And it's, it's unthinkable, the levels of corruption, the, 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 
blatant nature, nature, the brazen nature of corruption under this government. I mean, for those who accuse the NDC of being corrupt, today many of them are calling us saints. Because, I mean, this government... They are calling NDC saints. I'm telling you, because this government <laughs> epitomizes wow. the word C-O-R-R-U-P-T, corrupt. Look, from the head down to the least person in this party, in the NPP, they, they embody corruption, they embody nepotism, they embody cronyism, they embody incompetence, and, and the sheer brazen arrogance of power. When, when people are struggling to find their feet and make three square meals, you have people going on cruise ships in, in, in exotic mm -hmm. islands, and, and, and when you complain, they tell you to keep quiet. In the NDC, the NDC is very receptive to criticism. So Ghanaians criticize us, and we buckle. There was a bus branding issue where it was not as though someone had chosen to do something illegal. It was an issue of costing that had been increased. Due diligence was not done. A whole minister lost her job for that. The, the company was asked to refund, and they did refund and pay. Look at what's happening in the end. So can, 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 can I suggest to you that, in, in, in generally, generally speaking, eh, every government has scandals. So even under there are a lot of scandals. Well, well, well no, even even military so dictatorships, I'll, I'll, I'll even so, military so, so maybe, so, in our history have not so had maybe people, of scandals. So maybe people vote on the basis of how they feel their welfare is going. So have you what what? So yes, there are scandals, and there were a few under your government as well. Nothing compared to but, what you but, today. But do people vote on the basis of scandals, or on the basis of whether they feel their life is better? People in Ghana vote on the, on the basis of what they feel is a receptiveness to their real situation, the situation that faces them. If, if they think that you've lost touch with their reality, they'll kick you out. Okay, and let's call the speed a speed. It got to a certain point getting into the 2016 election, you could hold the NDC liable for that, that mm. we were beginning to lose touch okay. with what the realities were. We were beginning to, and Ghanaians kicked us out. This government, they've lost it completely. The president doesn't even appreciate what the challenges of Ghanaians are. When you speak to the president about the rising cost of living, he responds to you with free SHS. When you speak to them about the fact that our children are being kidnapped and we don't have responses from our security services, he responds with free SHS. That, that's Every that's single post thing post. you speak to the no, president no, about, post. it's not, it's not. Okay, it's the me, truth. Why, they respond to every problem of this country with free SHS. Why is it that the more, generally, this may not be true, for, why is that the more urbanized a place is, the more likely they are to vote for the NDC, generally, and the more rural, and I use Amasa as an example, even in Ningo Pram Pram, if that you look, example doesn't hold any. There program. are certain polling stations. So if, if you go to certain estates, they will vote for MPP. But if you go to certain communities, they will vote for NDC. Is that not a general truth? Why is that? Is, is it because of the way the party started? Is it because of, or is it that people who are booklong like MPP <laughs> and people who are non booklong like NDC? What, what's, what is your reading of that dynamic? So it's separate the urbanization discussion from Buklong and... <laughs> yeah, because they are in cities. Okay, okay, yeah. So you can, you can break that down for me. So it's not true that people in the NDC are not Buklong. Okay. We have a fair share, and a very good share, <laughs> of capable... Buklong people. Um, Buklong people. <laughs> Buklong people, if you want to put it that way. But uh, on a more serious note, I think it's just the... It's just the population dynamics in different... Everybody's, everybody's constituency, is, there's a slight difference. Uh, in mine, I'll have three major urban centers, but there are a few others that are growing, growing in size. And the settler communities, the settlers, maybe you could call them settlers, but they are like maybe Ashantis and Kurus and uh, those, um, those tribes, if I can put it that way, they form they form a bit of a different voting group, which may be more aligned to MPP sometimes. But in our place, we have a traditional one, which is the town of Senya Breku, which is traditionally an MPP. MPP. Yes. Which NDC does. Irrespective of what you do, irrespective of performance, they will tend to vote for MPP. They, they, they yes. Mm -hmm. Well, traditionally they do, but mm -hmm. it is possible to tend that, to make some inroads into that. And I believe that. So some of the voting is based on ethnicity, a fair bit of that. A fair bit of that, I think. So when you are doing your mapping, I know you put do that. You calculate this place, and people will get this. So I'll balance it with that place. Is that not a concern that people vote on the basis of where they are from, not necessarily what you give them? Is that not a problem for you? No, it, it depends on again. It depends on the on the urban center. The, um, it depends on the urban center and the characteristics of it. But you you must be aware of those dynamics, and. 
and basically do your calculations as you're saying and you know respond to them respond to them accordingly so your approach to this to this town may be a bit different from what you do in this town or you do in the other one yeah. So the places that t tend to vote for the NDC, because you've won the seat five times, MPP have won it twice, the people yes. that tend to vote for you are generally more agrarian and more rural and typically more fanti than... No, we're not fanti. Not fanti. We are, we're actually guans. Guan. The Hutus are guans. Okay. Traditional guans. And people of Senya Breku are also guans? Yes. So you are all the same people? Yes. So how come Senya Breku votes for MPP and then which other town votes for NDC? I think it's a political influence of some leaders in the past. Okay. Uh, Haruna Eseku, who was the former national chairman of the NPP. He's from Senya Breku? Yes. Okay. Um, I think uh, former vice president. Con Kensen Aka? Well, he came to the NDC, but I think had a little problem. Okay. On the NDC oh, side. So people remember all those things? They or they, they laid the foundations for generations? Something like that. Something like that. Oh, but, really? then, but then the youth, the, the group called the youth, have different dynamics altogether. And some of them do not, may not really look at that. They look at more like what's in it for them or what's, wow. what's their future, how do they see their future, you know, being panned out ahead of them, something like that. Were you surprised that Georgianda beat your sister? Mm, maybe a little. Maybe. Did you underestimate him when he was campaigning? Because I recall in those times when we interviewed Honorable Hannah Tete, she was saying, and I come to the ground and see. I, th <coughs> I think she felt that we were just enamored by his oratory or something. I don't know. So did you, are you guilty of underestimation in 2016, you feel? You should ask her that question. Well, you, you were in her team. <laughs> you were working for her, weren't you? So you would know. Maybe a bit of it, but, so not, but not anymore. You won't return the favor? Not anymore. Not, not underestimating anybody anymore. But you're pretty sure you can beat him? I can. Will you? I will. What are people saying to you on the ground? Take your news crew, news crew there <laughs> and go and do that interview and let me know, I know you what, feedback, now. what feedback you can get. <laughs> no, but on a more serious note, I mean, it is, it is uh, ripe for the NDC to get a seat back. I think he's taking us, I said it in one of the interviews when I was filing, that he's taking us, we are in reverse gear. I want to get the car back. What are the metrics? Employment, job creation, what is it? How is he taking you back? Take your crew there. <laughs> okay, I think that's a prepared <laughs> answer. No, because I like to know what people expect from MPs because you know that MPs are not supposed to bring roads, aren't you? You are supposed to represent them adequately and properly in Parliament. All right. So, so if he's taking you back, he's, like he's not been speaking well or he's not been building school. What's, what does he do? I, I don't want to personalize it so much, but let me put let me put it this way. So George came campaigning on a on a ticket uh, of George Anda. No, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Nobody thinks it's you. Honorable George Anda came campaigning on a ticket of power to do more. Okay. So there were a lot of promises, people were very expectant, and uh, the power to do more has not. Uh, and do what? That was a slogan. No, oh, power to do what? So maybe we should to have do, asked him at that point to do what? No, but what do you want to do? <laughs> you are the MP, <clears throat> aspirant. What, what does an MP do? That people who say they are disappointed. What is his work? So it's a combination of, well, okay, what's his, it's more like what he has not done. What because, hasn't he done? So Hannah had a very, at the time, Hannah had a very well laid out plan for infrastructure. She was very much development oriented and just trying to make sure that she could spread the developments across the constituency in a reasonably fair proportion. So, there, but there were a few key things that kind of maybe went against her at the time. There was this road from Aguna Suedro, the Mami Pokia's constituency going through ours to Eastern Region, which was started, which was awarded, the contractor started, and when the government, but it was, I think, it was a bit late in the day. And up to, then when the government changed, I'm not too certain I, whether it was abrogated or it was suspended or whichever way. But discontinued, certainly. Discontinued, which causes, which has caused so much inconvenience to, to motorists. I mean, to the extent that even the ambulance that must take people from Bodrasi Clinic to Swedru Government Hospital. You can imagine the, the the condition and the state of a patient when they move from that clinic all the way down the road to Swedru, which would have been maybe a 20 minutes drive, which would now take about 40 minutes or almost an hour. But is he responsible for the road? He's the MP. He's not the minister no, but, for roads. No, but the point, is the DC. No, but the point was that you see, you oversee certain things. You you have your oversight of some of these things. And the question is, why was it abrogated? The point is that development is for the people. Mm. So if 
and the new government comes in and decides to stop this or that, they really should be thinking about the people and the people's needs. It shouldn't be that because this was awarded this way, so we should give it, you know, it should stop. And it's a people, it's like when two elephants are fighting, the grass that suffers. And it should not be so. It simply should not be so. So the MP should be able to use their lobbying power to get infrastructure. The point is the MP should not have, if even the, the, the road, that particular road was abrogated, it should have made sure that by now something has been done in exchange of, to replace it, which has not been done. And it is a great, great inconvenience. Driving from my village to it, which would have been five minutes, so periodically they have a greater go on the road, but it's, that's, that's but not But when we speak to young people, most of them are concerned about work, jobs. That's what they usually talk about, not specific to your constituency. That seems to be what a lot of young people are concerned about. And is that, if there's no job, is, is that the MP's fault? No, not really, but the MP should be able to help. And I think he does that. I think he helps. To be fair to him, I think he, he does place people in Ghana Post and things that of. maybe, yes, uh, maybe directly within, under his uh, ministry's remit and so on and so forth. He's done a bit of that, to be fair to him. But the point is also that you are in, in the, MP's, the MP's remit, in a way. You are a development agent. The way our policies is in Ghana, you cannot run away from that. You can't. So you have to, literally, I, when I was going around talking to the delegates, I said, I appreciate that the work is literally divided into two. One, you come to across the parliament house to help to enact laws for the country. And on the other side, you must see to the, those development needs of the people. Even if the district chief executive is there to assist to do that, you are kind of senior to the district chief executive. And if you come into government, so if you come to Parliament House and you are close to other government agencies, surely you should be able to lobby and be able to bring certain things to your constituency if you can. That also depends on your, lo your personal lobbying skills. I mean, right now, the one other thing in my constituency is that the MP is a deputy minister of communication, but we have so many network issues. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> one more should if, if he's but there. He has, he, he has the means to no, make his constituency have better network than other parts of the country. I mean, that's, that's the least he can do. Lord, that would be, that's not correct. <laughs> what is not correct? That's not part of the way you're supposed to run a country. Direct is for state policy. It's supposed to make the system work for everybody, not for his constituency. No, but at least I'm speaking for my constituency. Somebody, some John will speak for his. John will speak for so his. So network is not good? Oh, ask him. So you improve network. What, what is your reading of your own constituency? So I have a very mixed place, right? right. You gave me some numbers about the fact that NDC didn't turn up. Right. So for you, it's not <clears throat> an, as MPP as the 10,000 suggests. No, it's not. But in terms of the demographics, what's your reading of the situation? We know there are some pretty posh parts, East mm -hmm. Ligon, mm -hmm. parts of Jowulu. Mm -hmm. We also know there are some fairly mm -hmm. middle level places. Well, well before, I, before I get into that, I mean, in 2008, Mm. Uh, NDC nearly won it because just because um, of certain internal things that happened um, in 2012 we only lost by 1006 votes and so I mean 1600 and so we've always almost come close to winning it I mean we've only won it in 1992 in and in 96 uh, we did win it but I think we went to court and then you know um, it was given back to the MPP at the, at the, at the end but when you, when you take a look at Ayawasu West. Yes, you have East Ligon, you mm -hmm. have West Ligon, you have Ligon, you have Abilengpe, Jowulu, mm -hmm. Roman Ridge. Yes, you see the beautiful buildings, everything is nice. But deep down, there are a lot of people, for the lack of a better expression, I'll probably say in the slums. And mm -hmm. these, these are the people that actually do the voting the most. These mm -hmm. are the people that need help. They need mm -hmm. sanitation, they need security, they need jobs. I mean, in the last 10 months of me walking extensively throughout this, I mean, East Ligon. It, it's, it's been heartbreaking. I mean, sometimes I take some of my friends there and they're like... You mean within East Ligon? Yeah, even within East Ligon. You, you, within East Ligon, you see one beautiful building, another beautiful building, and in the middle, there's a big gutter, and there are people living by the big gutter. And the number of people who live by that big gutter is more than 20 big houses. And these are the people who vote. These are the people who need the jobs. These are mm. the people who need sanitation and security. And so if you are able to cater to their needs, I mean, uh, definitely, NDC will definitely come but back. But what to can power. you do for them? Because you are an MP. <coughs> you are not uh, a president. Yes. What would you do for them? Look. You employ them on your farm. <laughs> well, it's a bit yeah. far. I wish I could employ them on my farm. But at the end of the day, most of these guys who live there are well-educated. Most of them have been to polytechnics, most of, most of them have been to schools, most of mm. their children mm. are in Ligon, are in UPSA, are in Radford, are in tech. And they always say, John, 
I just want jobs for my children. John, I just want you to help my children to, to even get to university. I mean, because since 2012, I've been offering scholarship to university students. and said, John, I just want you to get my child into school. So if it's not for them, it's for their children. And most of them are thinking about their children. And so they voted for me, or they want to vote for me. I mean, talking about the larger constituency, they want to vote for me because they know that I can speak, the, the, I can speak for the youth, mind you. About sixty percent of the whole total pop uh, voter population is made up of the youth, and so if you have a youth getting into parliament, he will definitely be the one to speak for you. I mean, it's. A but is it speaking for the need or the need jobs? MPP is providing them one D one F. Where? Um, at least in over one hundred and twenty districts. Have you, have, you, have, you seen, have you seen? Have you seen? Have you checked them yeah. out? Have you, have you seen it? I mean, I'm just. If you're asking me, they are doing planting for food and jobs. They are doing one village, one dam, and some of these projects. Because you're saying, they say they want jobs. Yes. How are you going to give them those jobs? Bernard, you just said MPP have been giving the people jobs. One D, one F. Where? Some about 150 districts. Have you been there? I'm currently saying came here with the list. Uh, did you not did, all. did we go and did see it? Did we verify it? Did we validate? verify it? You know, so what's your, so what's, what's your alternative? <laughs> but you didn't verify it. And no, so, no, because and so you're saying they, they want jobs. Yes. Unless you have... A, a means of <coughs> helping them get work. Mm -hmm. You're raising expectations. Mm -hmm. A lot of young people mm -hmm. need work. So what? Of course, you haven't entered full-time campaign, yes. so you may not have a full yes. program. Yes. But you're putting yourself in a position to say, look, these people say they won't work. Yes. And I'll speak for them. Yes. Is is the <coughs> lack of jobs or want of speaking for? Bernard, I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I'm a farmer. I'm a businessman. And so at the end of the day, I can provide jobs for the youth. That's the first one. The second one is that I can make them create their own businesses because when you when you when 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 i speak to the youth when i speak to the university graduate they say john we can't find jobs but i've started this small business what can you do for me john i want look and to be honest with you ever since i got into farming i have a lot of youth who've also equally gotten into farming and say john you are the one who inspired me to get into farming you are the one who who who, who said okay john let all the youth get into farming and we followed your footstep and at the end of the day if there are no jobs, you have to create jobs for yourself. And most of these guys are brilliant. Most of these guys are, 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 are intelligent. And they just need that little push. They just mm. need that little funds. They just need that little connection. They, they, they just need that little recognition that, you know what? I'm good with my hands. I can do shoes. I can sew. Mm. I, can, I can be a proper mechanic. I can do all these things. And so help me to get or realize my dreams. And it, I mean, I mean that's, that's, that's why I'm there for in, 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 in Ayawa's West. We'll take, a show, we'll, we'll take a show. We're going to come back. We'll read some of your comments and try and wrap up. My guests are John Dumelo, Gisela Agbotui, Tete, Tete, and, Agbotui. Tete Agbotui, and Samo Jata George. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. Let me read a few of your comments and then we'll come back in studio. Bernard, congratulations to your panelists. Just curious and find out from Honorable Samuel George why he was wearing a bulletproof vest during the election. This is from Hope L. Uh, Kobe says, I really love Samuel George. He's so brave and fighting. <laughs> Paul Agbolosu, collect money and vote for me. Cheap in our system. K2 South is in crisis. Okay. Andy McNastro, John, I promise you today that you will be a president one day in this country. Hey, he hasn't been here. <laughs> <laughs> Dalko, it's time that you took their place in the affairs of the country. Congratulations, John Dumelo. But I let John know that we voted for him to fix the drainage system in Jowlu. Mosquitoes have taken over. He should also fix our bad roads That's from K Jowlu. <laughs> he says, by the way, city, you are doing a great job. Keep it up. But the quality of candidates, the delegates of the Umbrella family have chosen to represent us. So us means you are NDC. Mm -hmm. Is running shivers down the spine of MPP. Mm. No wonder a couple in Ketu North had to abandon their wedding to cast their vote. If you can't beat us, join us from Comrade Haya, Branch Communications Officer Dodoa. So you are doing your politics. <laughs> your show now. Uh, good evening, comrades. My regards to all parliamentary candidates on your show. Please tell Jata, but his new name is Rainbow. Sam George, because of number seven. Some Meanwhile, CR7. Prince Henry Koforika, I'm highly disappointed in Ras Mubarak's comment against his opponent. If the party wants to win that seat, they should call him to give to order and ask him to prove or give evidence of his allegation, or else he should be sanctioned. This is, um, uh, and he also says, we need unity ahead of 2020. My regards to Dumelo Samjata and Junior Hanatete. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure she likes that. <laughs> so one of your colleagues said there was a lot of money and people have come against him. But you know that people use money in elections, and sometimes they use it to influence delegates. 
Mm. Why are we leaving Ras Mubarak to hang when he spoke the truth? And you are in parliament with him. You know it's true. Um, Not in terms of accusing assumption. somebody, but in terms of the fact that money played a major role in his, lo his loss. Well, we like to be hypocrites, don't we? We don't like the truth. Part of some judge's problem is that he speaks the truth without fear. We don't like people who tell the truth. When people speak the truth, we say that they are arrogant. We say that they are disrespectful. So Ghanaians or humans as we are, we like people who sugarcoat the truth and water it down for us. But the truth is the truth. I mean, I keep saying that if you do not make a demand, corruption is a demand and supply curve. Okay, if there's no demand for it, there'll be no supply. Okay, supply will only match demand. And so um, if you say you have corrupt politicians, it's because you have corrupt citizens who make demands of the politician. And to meet that demand, you get corrupt. It, I mean, it's a cycle. No, fish rots from the head, not the tail. Oh. Leadership flows from top down, not bottom oh, up. Oh, you see. So you can't say because citizens are corrupt, citizens are see, corrupt. Fishes don't swim with their head, they swim with their tail. Oh, please. Uh -huh. But the mind is in the head. So the control for the head no, no, is actually no, no, the no, tail. No, no, I mean, you no, can no, stop no, 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 But you see, you're, you're, you're saying what? And they are corrupt in every country, but it's leadership look, that determines what people go, right? Look, Isn't that why you're offering yourself for leadership? And, and who, says, who says that there is no corruption everywhere in the world? There is corruption everywhere in the world. But I agree with you. What you need to see is a certain sense of leadership, the kind of leadership that I believe the NDC is going to bring to bear going forward in this country. When you look at the crop of people who are being elected to, to parliament, I'm confident that the crop of people we've seen being elected, if that continues into the remaining constituencies mm -hmm. in the NDC, the NDC will definitely form the majority in the next parliament. Mm -hmm. Because you realize that the MPP has a very huge majority in parliament this time. But because of the quality and because of the fact that many of the people in there are yes men, and will control to what leadership says. You, you, you realize that you have a situation where people in the aisles of parliament will say to you, Charlie, this thing of men bring is not right. But when they get on the chamber, on the floor of the chamber, they will vote yes. People are unable to speak. Isn't to it time we dealt with funding of elections? Because that's the big issue. Well, you, you, you can. Where the money to, comes from. You, 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 can, you can want to raise that, that as a fact. But again, the, the, the reality of the question is, how are you going to monitor it, okay? How are you going to police the system? You have a system where you've, you've basically lost the basis. I think that this discussion is talking about the horses bolting after they bolted from so the So you don't table. think we can reform our political system in terms of funding of politics now? You can't, you can't refor reform political funding if you don't reform the kind of democracy you practice. The kind of democracy we practice in this country today is largely dr driven by What kind of democracy money. is that? It's money crisis we practice. Hmm. It's 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 effective. Where money crisis means what? When you have the money and you push it out and you're able to put it in, at, you cannot you cannot necessarily win an election just on the merit of your message. So people, that is the so even for delegates, because, you need because money. Because the delegates themselves. Ah, but, but when delegates come and meet you, and you can't look at them and just ask them to go, you need to provide wow. their TNT. And, and, and again, you see, for me, I don't necessarily find this as corruption. I don't find it as bad. I've always said that we must be minded about the democracy we practice. Our culture as Africans is one of, of gratitude. So we're taught as kids. Ben, to say thank you. To say thank you. Even when your parents did their legitimate legal responsibility of buying you a new dress for Christmas, you were taught to wake up at one thank, you, thank, thank you can be a word, not money, in an envelope. Well, we, we were taught to say thank you at first as kids, showing gratitude. And that has transcended in today's world into cash, because right now it's no longer word of mouth. But is it, is it thank you or people demand for it, otherwise won't vote for it, because they'll say, oh, you <laughs> won't charge it. Well, well, I haven't, I haven't, in Ingo Pram Pram, I haven't had any delegate say to me, give me X to vote for you. However, I know that in the politics that we practice, there is a certain expectation. Um, you, you go for a meeting and um, in Dangbe we say, mm. meaning we don't meet and just disperse. Mm. When we meet, we break cola, mm. or we, we, we share drink. So where do you get the money from to, to do the campaign? Uh, it's the same place you get money from to pay your child's school fees. <laughs> oh, my boss, he pays me for work. <laughs> okay, so politicians also have paymasters. <laughs> no, pay no they don't have to pay myself an employer. Your, your employer your employer, your your employer is a state, so we pay you a parliament. In fact, your salary goes through a system and we know how much you are paid. Yes, but that's what I'm saying, that politicians, that, that political financiers in every, in every institution. So you, you, have, you, have, you have 
godfathers who give you money. They are not godfathers. They are political financiers. They are benefactors. They are people. They are people who who contribute. The same way you have philanthropists who decide that every year from my income I'm going to give X amount so it's to this particular charity. It's political philanthropy. And you sit down and tell me that you speak the truth all the time. <laughs> but the fact you that have the street face. Yes. They don't demand anything of you. In opposition, what are you going to demand of me? You can influence laws. You can sit what down. Do you have to give, no, no, have to give no, the position. No, no, but, but are you worried about how, the money? John, are you worried about money? Or are you already rich? You don't bring you already a risk actor. So. <laughs> what? what do you say about worried? What do you mean? Because you need money to run a campaign. Yes, you do. But money is relative. Needing money is relative. You, you can't quantify it. At the end of the wow. day, you, you can use two cities to win an election. Somebody can use... 100,000 and lose an election. And so mm. you can't really quantify it. It's about the message to the people. It's about what you're telling the people. It's about the message you're selling. Wow. That, will, what, that is what will make you win, I mean, I mean, I mean, the election. I mean, at the end of the day, look, even uh, primaries that happened, it wasn't because of money that people voted for me. My people are hungry for, for the seat. Ayawaso West, NDC, they are hungry for the seat, and that's why they voted for me. It's not because I gave them maybe one CD or two, which I didn't even do, but it's not because of that. It's because mm. they are just hungry for the seat, and they see that I'm the one to deliver them to the promised land. Your, 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 mm. mate, your presumed opponent will be the widow of the former MP. Right. And I am told that she did a lot of good work in mm. places that NDC expected to win, mm. even within the by-election, mm. Seram and Hassan. Mm. How are you assessing your chances against her? Well, I mean, they are going to primaries very soon, and whoever wins, we are ready. I mean, at the end of the day, even as we speak, there's a lot of turmoil in the MPP because, uh, you know, they, they've seen that my delegates or Iowa West delegates overwhelmingly endorsed me. Mm. And so we are united. We are united to win the seat. Mm. So at this point, it's not about who's coming in the MPP. We don't fear anybody coming in the MPP. We know that we only fear God, and wow. we're going to get a seat. Wow, that's interesting. I, I, wanted to, I don't want to go to the, the, the money place with you because Samuel George has tried to answer, but he, he really couldn't convince me. But you, you do, do you agree that our political system needs fixing? Because as I was saying to you before we went on air, the precision with which you politicians calculate and win elections doesn't translate into governance generally. And this is for NDC, MPP, everybody. So is it because the system doesn't allow you to do as politicians now, what you're supposed to do, or is harder governing than it is campaigning? Because there's a gap between the way you organize and do campaign, and when you come to power, but, uh, <laughs> both parties. But Bernard, personally, I'm not there yet, so I... You're already there. You are on two important boards. You're part of those who build the new airport. You've been on the local government assembly, so you're already in politics. Yes, but I was performing, so I don't know where your question is coming but from. But collectively, politicians feel like people all the time. I mean, he said it. East Legon poor, sleeping near gutters. There's a lot of poverty in Ghana. Ghana is the only country in, in this part of the continent, apart from Nigeria, where the GDP has grown consistently and inequality has improved. More, we have more poor people now. The system is failing them. So you can't tell me that you can't answer that. The fact that you're not in parliament doesn't mean you can't answer that question. You know. So, <laughs> okay, so on a scale of 1 to 10, mm -hmm. if I take government for government, let me see John Muhammad's government yes. and Ado's government, between the two, they're definitely not co-equals. John Muhammad's, yes, John Muhammad's government did much better than Ado's government did in four years. Give the time. Remember there was a court case that took about eight months or so. Yeah. GM had literally had to race to do what he had to do in three years, three years and a few months. Nanado's government has gotten two years and eight months. Eight months. And compare in terms of... I'm saying six of one, half a dozen of the other. I'm saying both are equally bad from the point of view of 20 years. We've had people lead us from Rawlings to Mills to Kufour to whoever. So the question is actually a generic question. I'm not asking you to talk about NDC and PP. I'm saying, how come you people keep failing us? Even though you come and campaign, you say nice things, we vote for you, speak good English. We don't We don't see anything. It, you see, you have to be specific because some governments do better than others. And that's a fact. But collectively, <laughs> still. No, don't put them together. Separate because them. Because it's a continuum. It's government is a continuum, but some... For example, you know, if you look po poverty statistics from 92 to 96, and then they do 98 to 2000, so it's in years. Sometimes it goes over parties. The inequality is increasing, irrespective of who is in power. So I'm asking you as a politician, not to compare record, no. Why can't you guys sort out our problems? They are sorting out your problems. It may be just that uh, everybody has a different approach and different... 
time frame and that sort of thing. But they are sorting out sorting the problems. So if GM comes 2020, things will get better? Of course. For all but, of us. No, but can't you, can't you, can't you compare? No, Chelsea? I can't. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not that smart. No, I'm, no <laughs> come on, Bernard. You're one of the smartest guys. Yeah, but I don't see what you're saying. But, well, Bernard, let, let, okay. let, me just, let me just throw some light on this. Let, let's, let's make it real for our, our viewers. When GM had at least 50 Ghanaian contractors working on 50 different cocoa roads across the country, there were at least at each of those sites 50 Ghanaian youth working. Okay. So you had 2,500 Ghanaian youth working. Nanado comes, suspends those contracts, spends $10 million auditing those contracts, finds no, 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 no you, you corruption. Have, you have your day. Spot, finds no corruption. <laughs> but what you see is yeah. that 2,500 Ghanaian youth have been put out of jobs for two years. So, yes, it may appear we collectively. Run out of time. It may, appear collectively, it may appear collectively <laughs> that we're retrogressing. No but problem. When we take two steps forward with an NDC government, yes. an MPP government comes in and takes us three steps backwards, that's and we have to you come back and do it You have your day against, so the, your day against the MPP. <laughs> Thank you for being on the show. I had uh, uh, Samojata George, MP for Ningo Pram Pram. Gisel, and parliamentary candidates, please add it. Especially with Seven Gap, <laughs> Gisel yeah. Atete Abutui, who is the uh, NDC candidate for Ewutu Senya West. West. And John Dumelo. He is the candidate for AWW. I ask where's Ogun. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for, for watching. My name is Bernard Avale. Stay with us.